Letters by L.D. Lewis. Sasha, 9.45 p.m. Off soon. Pizza tonight? Allie stared at her sister's message a moment before answering. The city had been in the throes of a heat wave for the better part of a week now, and not even night was cool enough. The air was still thick, still humid, and breathing felt like drowning. Eating somehow seemed like it made things hotter. She sent Sasha a non-committal thumbs up and crossed the street. Somewhere to the south, bass rattled center city. The chants of protest crowds bounced off of tall buildings and met the block as distant, warbled echoes. The people who passed her on their way to join the fray seemed more excited than angry tonight. Maybe there was progress. Maybe the heat had everyone a little delirious. The neighborhood had begun its road to gentrification. The shops still had signs subtitled in Spanish, but as Allie walked the familiar cracked sidewalks to the corner store, she passed rows of houses that had been given fresh paint jobs and new windows with young white couples to occupy them. Their AC units humming as those occupants without mingled, melting on stoops. A small light-skinned woman named Mrs. Harlow sat in her window as she did most nights with a fan blowing her lace curtains and the scent of flowers in her window box out toward the street. She had more of a glare about her than a soft gaze, as if she liked absolutely none of what she saw. But Allie saw her soften whenever she greeted her. Doing all right there, girly, said Mrs. Harlow as Allie paused in front of her house. She had a deep, gravelly voice, as if she'd sung or smoked for years. I think I might burst into flames in a minute here, Allie replied. You're up late tonight. Mm-hmm, so is everybody else. You know me. I gotta know what's going on. Allie smiled. I'm making a quick run. Do you need cold water or anything from Mr. Donovan's? You Carmichael girls are always so helpful, she chuckled. No, baby, my water gets cold enough just fine. You can tell Miss Sasha when she gets in, though, to come see me. I don't think this new medicine my doctor's got me on is doing my blood pressure right. I will, Allie nodded. Sasha was the neighborhood medical professional, and she looked after the residents when she could. She was a paramedic. Allie was visiting for the summer, and Sasha's shifts were long and often led Allie to entertain herself. That usually meant watching TV and alternating pizza and Chinese takeout. She crossed another street and turned into the corner store, grateful even for the barely functioning air conditioner inside. Hey, young lady, the shop owner called. He sat behind the counter, framed by colorful shelves of all the things people still smoked, his attention on a small TV screen. His gray cat, Gustavo, had positioned himself atop a chip rack between the freezer wall and an oscillating fan. Hi, Mr. Donovan, Allie replied on her way to the wall of beverage coolers. Yes, she groaned into the freezer. She closed her eyes as the chill kissed her sweat-soaked skin. She could get away with standing in the open door for maybe 30 seconds before Mr. Donovan snapped his fingers and yelled something about charging her an AC tax. Twenty-eight seconds in, she grabbed three bottles of water and went to the counter with them. Mr. Donovan reminded her of someone's domino-hustling uncle, all gray hair slicked back carefully, a thin gold chain peeking from un beneath the unbuttoned collar of a coral linen shirt. He shook his head and gesticulated at the screen between bites from a fist of caramel corn. Mira, they still at it, he muttered at her. This about that man the cop shot, Allie said, digging money out of her messenger bag. Nah, the other thing. Then again, what ain't about it, right? Mr. Donovan grunted and rang up the waters. Allie watched as the nightly news recapped the week's protests throughout the city. Early days of clever signs, unified chants, hopeful speeches from the woke and diverse community leaders bled into the collapse of resolve when people started passing out from heat exhaustion around day three. White protesters featured so prominently in daytime coverage somehow disappeared from nighttime footage of tear gas deployment, riot gear, the faces of brown strangers confront contorted in war cries during clashes with police. They got the mayor to step down behind this or that, but that ain't what everybody was after, he said, then raised an eyebrow at her. Surprised you're not out there. All this what kids your age do now, ain't it? Fight that power? A pang of guilt shot through Allie's chest. She'd come to the city because it was a place where things happened, and yet she'd done nothing. There was something intimidating about taking to the streets. 
It wasn't the danger, exactly, but everyone on the news seemed so sure of themselves and their purpose. She imagined herself being swept up into the throngs, into some foreign part of the city, too embarrassed to cut the fevered momentum and ask anyone how to get home. She knew she'd stammer live on camera. Jan Wellington from Channel 4 sticking a mic in her face and asking plainly where she stood on the issues of the day, and she'd stare dead-eyed into the lens and belch, uh, justice is bad. Chiron reads, Area Teen knows nothing. She cared, though. Injustice mattered. But she was too young to vote or to count petitions or, and nothing unjust enough ever happened to her specifically to give her any kind of authority. So who would listen? The image on the screen shook violently about the same time Allie heard a thundering boom outside. Jan Wellington all but leapt out of her shot and the camera jolted its focus on a group of protesters fleeing a flash of light and a plume of smoke. Allie caught Mr. Donovan's eye for a brief second before a great warping sound plunged them into darkness. Before Mr. Donovan could complete his groan, the ground shook beneath them, and a sound like a distant transformer popping made Allie jump. And there, then, there was another. Closer. The third roared like a freight train rolling up the street. It shattered the shop windows and sent Allie to the ground, covered in glass. The roar grew and continued to shake items from the shelves. Glass bottles fell from open refrigerators and smashed against the tile. Then all at once it stopped, and she was left with the sounds of her own panting, her own blood pounding in her ears. Tires skidded and car alarms sounded. The sky outside was thick and rolling dust when she dared open her eyes. She gingerly brushed small glass shards from her legs and collected herself. Mr. Donovan came around the counter to help her up. You okay? He coughed. <coughs> yeah, I think, Allie frowned, reaching for her phone. What was... Without another word, both of them peered out of the space where the window had once been, at the cloud of gray creeping up the block, and the hole in the skyline where a coffee shop and a dry cleaners were now sagging brick and mortar into the middle of the street. The road itself rippled and split away from the impact. Neighbors poured out of their homes, each staring agape and silent at the wreck. Allie felt whole minutes pass, as no one seemed to know what to do. I need some help over here, someone yelled from somewhere in the cloud. Ah, it's people in there, Mr. Donovan yelled in case anyone hadn't heard. He left her side and began milling around with his flashlight. Sasha. Panicked, Allie called her sister's phone, but the line rang once and went to voicemail. You calling Sasha, Mr. Donovan asked. Went to voicemail, Allie replied. Her voice sounded small and distant to her own ears. Mr. Donovan stopped his shuffling and eyed her. She's okay, you know, he said. Allie nodded, but she wasn't sure. Sasha would have at least tried to call her by now. Look, you take this and give me your phone. He handed her a flashlight newly packed with batteries he'd just opened and handed her over the phone. She handed over her phone. Head home and wait for her, but call 911 on your way there, yeah? And when you meet up, call me. My number's in there. We gonna need you. He handed her phone back and gave her a hard pat on the shoulder before turning back to the rummage through his stock. Allie made her way quickly across the crunching glass into the thick night air. Sirens sounded in the distance. She tried Sasha's phone again, but got nothing, so texted her instead. 10.03 p.m. I'm fine. Heading home. Where are you? Off soon. Pizza tonight was still the last message Sasha had sent. Allie chewed a fingernail as she peered out of the living room window at the dark chaos on the street below. Car horns still blared. Cries for help mingled with shouted efforts to organize some relief. People moved in the glow of headlights and bouncing cell phone flashlights through the heavy, phone, through the heavy dust. Push notifications told her the city had been rocked by a series of explosions, which was perfectly useless information if you lived there. Emergency services were at capacity. Blackout was trending on Twitter, which was already flooded with missing persons and videos from every angle. Emergency services sirens could be heard in nearly every periscope, but no one got a shot of the vehicle. She was hoping to spot Sasha's rig. Searching for it had drained her battery down, around 30%. Her parents' check-in phone calls dropped it down to 15%. Over the din, she heard, she's bleeding pretty badly. Panicked at the thought that maybe Sasha had been crushed, she leaned out of the window and pointed a flashlight up the block, stopping where she saw the neighbors crowded in Mrs. Har Harlow's stoop. One of them, a man Allie didn't know, squinted in the direction of the light. Hey, Sasha up there, he called. 
No, she's still at... Well, she didn't know where she was. She's not here. You got, like, a first aid kit, said another man beside him. Mrs. Harlow's a little banged up. Yeah, one second, Allie replied. She turned the flashlight back into the apartment and scanned for the big yellow street medic backpack she knew Sasha kept in case of emergency. She found it in Sasha's bedroom closet. She checked her phone again. In case... She checked her phone again for a message from Sasha, but there was nothing, and her battery was all but dead. Maybe Sasha's phone was destroyed. Maybe she was hurt and couldn't get to it. Waiting, doing nothing, was no longer an option. She checked the bag and found a hundred tiny pockets and compartments laden with medical supplies. Gloves, gauzes, a dozen types of bandages and bandanas, Sudacon wipes, and various ointments. She grabbed a clutch of pale blue breathing masks from a front pocket and put one on. Whatever that building was made of, it was probably a good idea not to breathe it in. She dropped some bottles of water into the bag along with her phone's charger in case she found power somewhere outside and left a note scrawled in Sharpie on a pizza menu taped to the door. Phone died. Be back when I find you. The dust and debris looked like thick flakes of heavy falling snow passing through Allie's flashlight beam. She approached her neighbors, each of them caked with sweat-streaked dust and held the light unsteadily on Mrs. Harlow, who appeared to be bleeding from the head. The dust had stemmed the stream of blood, leaving a matted, dark patch just along the silver of her hairline. Doorframe was leaning, so we had to break it down to get her out, a burly black man with a sledgehammer was saying to a woman leaning over Mrs. Harlow. Blast must have shifted this whole block. Yeah, I couldn't get my front door just now either. You check the other houses, the woman replied. Allie recognized her as one half of the white couple who lived next door in the house with the new blue shutters and tomato garden out front. Mrs. Harlow side-eyed her more than anyone on a good day and didn't seem too pleased to be in her care just then. Nah, we saw her first, said one of the men. The woman turned to Allie. You the medic? Me? No. I have a bag of medical supplies, though, Allie replied. That you, Allie girl, said Mrs. Harlow, squinting into the flashlight beam. It's me, Mrs. Harlow. I'm Claire, the woman introduced herself. John, said the elder man with the sledgehammer. Mac, said the younger one. We thought maybe she fell or something and... You could ask me, you know. I was there. I could tell you, Mrs. Harlow snapped and looked pointedly at Allie, as if she were the only one there worth speaking to. <clears throat> I was leaning out the window when the blast went off and rocked the house. The window shattered around me and I hit my head on the frame, ducking back in. It wasn't no brick. I apologize, Mrs. Harlow, John said patiently. Roads are garbage. There's no way to get anyone hurt to the hospital. Firehouse is the next best bet, but that 30-minute walk is an hour now on the back streets with all the obstructions. And I only know a couple of Grey's Anatomy seasons worth of first aid, said Claire. Allie pinched the flashlight between her cheek and shoulder and rummaged through the pockets of the bag for something that might trigger a memory of health class or an episode of Chicago Fire. Of Sasha talking about a head-injured patient when she came home to visit, her hands flying the way they always did in pantomime of saving a life. A small book glinted at her from a rear compartment. She pulled it out to find the cover wrapped in yellow, reflective tape with the red cross at the center. The title page read, Street Medic Handbook. Found something, she said, flipping through the warm pages. A dozen acronyms were bolded, circled, highlighted, each a different procedure checklist, and her sister's handwriting was scribbled in the margins. Finally, she went back to the table of contents to find a section on head injuries. She went down a short checklist. The patient was unresponsive, hadn't lost consciousness, clearly didn't seem disoriented. What kind of wound is it? Allie asked. Mrs. Harlow, I'm going to pour water on it just so we can get a clear look at it, okay? Said Claire. "Mm Mm-hmm, Miss Harlow muttered in her disapproving way. Whatever gets y'all to stop fussing the fastest. Claire dribbled water over the wound and dabbed it away from over Mrs. Harlow's eye with the bottom of her shirt. Doesn't look too bad. Not deep, not open. Allie read from the book. Scalp. External laceration. May look really bloody because there are a lot of capillaries in the scalp. Treat like other lacerations, but give care should be given to protect vital centers of the brain, spine, etc. Easy enough. There's nothing wrong with my spine, Mrs. Harlow groaned. Allie handed Claire a bunch of bandages and some tape, and the two of them got to work cleaning and wrapping the wound. You doing okay, girlie? Mrs. Harlow asked in between winces. A little freaked out, honestly. Haven't heard from Sasha since before the explosions. She was on her way home. Oh, she's okay. Mrs. Harlow gripped Allie's hand firmly and gave her a serious look. You don't worry. She's probably out there somewhere helping like you. Got trapped on the other side of that mess. Allie nodded. She'd been trying not to look at the ruin in the street. She could imagine Sasha somewhere beneath it. 
I haven't heard from my husband either, Claire said, ripping off a small section of tape with her teeth. He was on his way home from the airport. Cell signal's been spotty and I can't get through. Allie said nothing. She watched as Claire focused on the very specific placing of tape along Mrs. Harlow's bandage, the way she firmly but gently pressed it into place, as if a moment's focus on anything else would wreck her. It wasn't enough to say she was sure Mr. Claire's husband was fine, that he would be home soon, just like Sasha. With all the wreckage in the city, it was beginning to dawn on her that not everyone could have survived. She felt sick. <laughs>